Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for some of you. This is John Peterson with Centurus. Welcome to uh, today's <clears throat> series in our what we call our Right Tool for the Job series of educational webinars. Uh, we're going to be focusing on a, a topic of <clears throat> pretty much universal interest uh, amongst us practitioners in the analytics and, and BI space. Um, the comparison and contrast between enterprise <clears throat> business intelligence platforms and and the more newly emerged uh, self-service analytics tools uh, and some basic thoughts around that uh, as to where they apply and which one might be the best tool for your particular application. So today's session is a fairly action-packed one. Um, we're going to have a brief introduction um, about uh, Centurus and actually uh, specifically uh, our, inv our involvement with these various tools over the last 16 years. Then we'll roll into uh, our view of the state of the market, um, a brief overview of what's happening out there, uh, and get into some specific definitions and examples. Um, we'll then uh, talk about some major feature comparisons. We're not going to go into the nitty gritty of every uh, specific feature of all tools. It changes too rapidly and it's too broad a topic, but there are some broad buckets that we're going to touch on that I think are important decision, uh, in decision making around which tool to use for your particular application. And then we're going to talk um, uh, about four specific case studies that kind of uh, bring home the important similarities and differences of these tools and hopefully uh, can give you an idea of how it might best apply in your particular application. And then we'll talk, uh, give you guys a few more additional resources. As you know, we've always got uh, continuous ev events and activities, and then uh, a question and answer session. Uh, today's uh, presenters uh, are myself and Albert Valdez, who uh, heads up our training practice. Uh, Albert is probably well known amongst many of you in the community, uh, with a real serious depth in, in a lot of these tools. And, and uh, the two of us hopefully will be able to tackle the uh, uh, the topic with a sufficient level of detail to to um, help you guys. So with that, I'm going to uh, brief overview about Centurus. Um, we are a business analytics consulting firm. Uh, for those of you who have not attended our events before, um, we are essentially laser focused on business analytics as it pertains to dashboards, reporting, visualizations. Uh, we spend an awful lot of time on data preparation and uh, staging your data. That's where most of the work, frankly, in these systems to be successful must go in. Um, and then we offer uh, uh, services in a, in a broad range of spaces, including enterprise planning and, and uh, big data, predictive analytics. Um, as part of that, we have a broad set of offerings that include uh, many different types of consulting, ranging all the way from mentoring to turnkey projects. Uh, over the years, we've developed a series of tools that allow us to accelerate developments of these systems, including some interesting software connectors uh, that um, allow people to do things that are not possible with the current tool sets. Um, we would encourage you, if you have any uh, interest in following up with us, uh, there's a uh, again, it's a broad set of offerings that uh, range everything from a couple days of assessments and, and consulting to, to large scale in, in uh, uh, projects. Uh, the key here is that we actually uh, feel comfortable enough with our methodology over 2,000 products, projects that we've been able to offer a 100% money back guarantee on what we do to take the risk out of the equation for, in people's minds. The interesting part about this as it pertains to um, this uh, session today is we've had an opportunity to work with over 900 clients over the last 16 years. And one of the things that is, is, is turned out to be the case across many of our clients, first of all, most of the clients, and uh, including those uh, shown on the screen here, uh, do not have a single uh, analytic or BI tool in place. They oftentimes run a range of tools. Um, uh, and the, it, it's mainly because they have a range of different possible applications in their environment. And this has become more and more clear in the last uh, four or five years that one size does not fit all. And um, across all industries, this seems to be the case. And so what we're going to draw upon our um, experience from these various industries and project types and 
functional areas of businesses to try and give you a flavor for what uh, what these different tools do and, and which one might be appropriate for your involvement. So with that, I'm going to roll into a, a very high-level overview of the state of the market. Um, the interesting thing is that Gardner actually made quite a stir earlier this year uh, when they published a magic quadrant for business analytics that many of you may have seen um, that actually uh, on, uh, at, on the face of it looked like they had all of a sudden dropped some of the significant players from their matrix. Uh, players such as Oracle's OBIE product, um, for instance, and uh, what they actually had done was they had actually parsed out uh, the tools that had made their way into their analyses in 2010 under the category of data discovery and visualization tools, tools such as Tableau, uh, ClickTech, um, and uh, uh, tools along those lines, particularly des desktop tools aimed at the at the business user, and they had pulled those out into their own separate magic quadrant, and will be publishing a magic quadrant on what they've been calling more their sort of leg legacy or traditional uh, BI suites in in an upcoming uh, uh, report. The reason they did that is um, this quote from Gartner which I'll just read uh, directly because uh, it, I think it says it all, is that you know the business analytics or intelligence analytics market has passed a tipping point as it shifts away from the IT-centric uh, reporting-based platforms toward modern BI and analytics that enable smarter analytics and greater agility. The interesting thing I want to point out here is that um, they are making sort of an implicit, in my opinion, implicit value uh, a judgment uh, by using the word modern. It is our take that these tools are yet another tool in your box, and this, these sorts of quotes would lead you to conclude that they are replacing the traditional solutions, uh, when in fact they are augmenting in many cases and improving upon certain aspects of these tools. And we're going to get into that in more detail as we go into this presentation, and I think you'll see um, where, uh, where, the, where these various tools play. The interesting part about that in behind the scenes is, uh, frankly, more and more companies are using um, more than one tool. Uh, from the attendees in today's session, we had 234 unique companies respond, and 35% uh, or more are using more than one solution, 10% more than two solutions, and the average was over uh, it was is around 1.5. So it's clear that uh, organizations are, are turning to a, a, a broad set of tools as they as this space increases in in size and moves into many different functional areas in the business, while at the same time needing to adapt to a higher speed, higher frequency of information um, uh, and decision making. Uh, um, aspects in an organization. So um, I want to set a couple uh, definitions in place before we move into some of the specific feature comparisons. Um, our definitions, what we, we spent a good deal of time discussing what, what are the appropriate ways to classify these types of systems. And we came into two basic buckets, enterprise business intelligence platforms, traditional ones like IBM Cognos or business uh, SAP business objects, um, and then uh, self-service analytics tools, uh, as I mentioned, you know, your, your clicks and your uh, tableaus. Um, the traditional enterprise uh, uh, analytics tools are really uh, the ones that people have known for, they've been around for years, they're typically managed by the IT department in a centralized fashion. Uh, there's typically a, a data model that's fairly rigid that sits upon on top of a set of data warehouses or data marts, oftentimes well-structured data, um, and provides end users with access to this information in a governed, secured, and well-validated uh, fashion. Um, these these sorts of systems support very large scale uh, deployments and um, oftentimes are geared toward high volume automated delivery of standardized reports. They have been adapted over the years to provide some level of ad hoc functionality. Uh, for instance, if the information is within the data model or data warehouse as it's being exposed to these tools, it's oftentimes quite easy for a user to create 
um, uh, using some of the current interfaces uh, and ad hoc report. However, um, it's, it becomes much more difficult as you start to move outside of data sets that are not currently within these models. And that has spawned the need for this sort of second class of analytics um, uh, upon uh, in the eyes of the business user. Um, Gardner calls these a sort of more modern. Uh, we like to refer to them as, as more self-service analytics, uh, typically at more agile. It's oftentimes uh, uh, managed, uh, procured, and, um, uh, and most of the data is, is oriented toward the departmental level. Uh, the agility, um, it really comes from the ownership by the business. These tools are typically deployed first on desktops which is intriguing when you hear the word modern. When we first started the business 15 years ago, uh, it turns out that the desktop tools were the common standard, and the more modern ones that existed that, that came out after that were the server, client server and web, uh, web and zero footprint based uh, uh, products. When in, and so it's interesting now to hear the word modern applied to a kind of what would be, could be considered a throwback to the desktop uh, uh, installation process, um, uh, as an aside. Uh, data sources tend to be very more, uh, much more varied. Um, they're oftentimes uh, CSV files, spreadsheets, uh, uh, coupled with database uh, um, file or database connections to existing uh, systems within, um, within a, a, a an organization's uh, environment, and in some cases, these time these are, are hooked up to, to uh, a growing amount of cloud-based data. Um, the the key here is um, oftentimes there are groups within an organization that have not been well served by the traditional solutions um, because the data is that they need is not in the system or for uh, whatever reason, licensing, what have you, they typically haven't been able to access uh, the, the data or the tools that help them improve their job. That's Those are the people that are turning first to, and uh, we found in our experience that HR groups happen to be one of the largest uptakes of, of some of these newer tools because they simply aren't getting the types of data that there's the you know through the main systems that typically carry sales and financial data. A few caveats as we move into a little deeper dive into the features is first of all um, in the software world everything's always in a state of flux, especially when you start to look across uh, a broad set of platforms. Um, and on any given day, there's usually a vendor releasing a new version of product that that adds or uh, uh, modifies features. And so when we set out to actually tackle this project, this was uh, a number of months ago, we quickly realized that um, a feature feature by feature at the detail level comparison was an insurmountable task. However, there are broad um, categories of features that can be reliably grouped over time and, um, uh, and, and compared. Um, so what we don't want to do is, is, is say that a particular vendor or a particular tool is only this type. There's a, it's actually a broad set of features across a lot of these tools. They overlap well. So we're going to be painting a broad brush. I would encourage you to, to inquire deeply with us on the specifics of your particular application. Most tools, however, are somewhat purpose-built <clears throat> for certain benefits. Um, and the traditional uh, enterprise BI tools uh, were built around uh, some of the aspects that I mentioned earlier. And um, so in depending on your particular use case, you might actually be well served by um, a traditional tool or might be better served by one of the more agile uh, self-service analytics tools. So it really comes down to the business case. One other major caveat is, and we've seen this even within our own team, um, we've had the benefit of actually uh, uh, working with pretty much all the BI tools over the years. Um, and we've got specialists on our team that have worked in each of these environments. And literally, um, an expert with a given tool can do virtually anything with that tool. So um, when, a great way to get into an argument is to say, you know, that, that Tableau doesn't do this. Well, with the proper third-party plug-in and uh, amount of contortions, you can make it do anything. Same is true with the uh, traditional tools. So we, we want to hear, again, we're painting a broad brush. We're not trying to get into um, a feature-by-feature feature, uh, duke out, particularly in the hands of experts. We're aiming more at your 
your mainstream business users in terms of this particular uh, presentation. Um, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, most organizations do have um, uh, more than one tool, and oftentimes the decision is 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 not what which one to new one to buy, but which one of their existing licenses to use. Um, and in some cases, there may be a need for a, a, a new purchase. Um, there are, just to reiterate the obvious, but there are many different types of reporting and analytics in organizations, including standardized reports, dashboards, scorecards. Those are typically ones where the metrics are part of the strategic direction and goals of the company and are, are fairly well set in stone, and the data sets are broadly applicable across the organization. Um, and then you move into some of the more lighter weight or the, the ad hoc analysis tools and query tools, those are the ones that typically are, are required for one-off uh, inquiries or, or uh, stuff where you're, you know, we have many clients that are saying, hey, I've got these data sets, I think they would be valuable, but until I start looking at them, I'm not sure um, what metrics I'm going to be able to derive from them. Uh, that's a completely different um, problem that, that you're solving. So um, the key takeaway, though, is no one tool regardless of what the vendors might say, uh, and in fact, even vendors will admit this, no one tool solves all uses perfectly. <clears throat> so um, before we go any further, one of the questions that we wanted um, to ask was, in your opinion, um, and I'm going to launch the poll right here, um, does having a variety of tools in your organization benefit the organization? Um, this is this is oftentimes a debatable topic, um, and uh, we'd like to hear what people have to say on this particular topic before um, moving into the next session. And we'll share, by the way, this information. And it's interesting. Um, the widest number of folks believe that uh, different tools are optimized for different tasks. Um, and that's no surprise, and I alluded to it earlier. The interesting part is that there's also a set of folks that we see, uh, particularly those in centralized IT organizations, that believe that having the added complexity of multiple tools, especially if everybody in, in every department gets to choose whatever they want, um, has uh, potentially uh, negative effects. Um, that We hear that um, uh, quite commonly. Um, and uh, then there's the, the folks that believe that this is really more of a democratic process and should be handled by the business users. With that, I'm going to move on to the next um, slide, and then we'll hearken back on on that, I'll let Albert uh, touch touch back on on this particular topic. Um, so, what is our perspective on this? Um, we we come uh, from a business user centric perspective. At the end of the day, it's all about running your business, maximizing your revenue, maximizing your gross margin, uh, improving on on your your various uh, uh, metrics in whatever organization you're in, and that. Um, there is a mountain of research that says that decision making via data is typically much better than via gut. So if you conclude that, then any any set of tools, uh, regardless how many, that uh, allow end users to make better data driven decisions is a good thing, and in fact have has very high ROI. Um, so the interesting part about this is that. Um, then the question comes down to, all right, well, uh, then what is the particular right tool? What's the best tool for the job? And then what we've also found is uh, how do you best get that tool um, installed and uh, the data sets prepared to make, your, make that tool work to its, uh, its fullest in any given environment? So what it comes down to is the tool matters, um, but frankly, the job matters much more. Um, this, uh, these two slides just point out that um, if you go out to find something that cuts something, uh, you're, you could be presented with a range of options from uh, large chainsaws to butter knives, and there is no right answer as to which one is, is, is the best tool in, until you actually look at what's the job you're trying to do. Right? If you're felling a large uh, tree, uh, versus, uh, you know, 
preparing something for your meal, obviously um, a given tool is going to be um, more appropriate for the task at hand. And this this is no uh, this is uh, just as true in the BI and analytics world as it is in in uh, hair cutting and uh, turkey turkey carving. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Albert to go into um, a deeper dive into um, the various these two platforms types and speak about some of the salient feature uh, uh, similarities and differences, and then we'll circle back to uh, a couple of specific use cases. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Albert, and uh, just let me know when you'd like me to advance the slides. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, John, for setting the stage for us. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that we set the right context here and made some clear definitions about what it is we're talking about. So this is a slide that you've seen for, gosh, you know, 20 years now, right? We've, we've always kind of followed this traditional approach in terms of architecture in the enterprise BI space. And it still has a lot of value. We, we aren't moving away from this, right? We don't uh, get to 2016 and say, well, things have changed, so this architecture is no longer valid. We know that there's benefit in creating a single version of the truth using traditional types of ETL processes and following enterprise data warehousing, uh, data collection practices, delivering information that's centrally managed so that we have, again, that single version of the truth that the business logic and business rules are centralized and not everybody's out there creating their own definitions. And then at the front end, we have, that's where things really have changed over the last 10, 15 years is the types of tools that we have. So analytics and traditional business intelligence tools, although they have evolved and are in slightly different state than they um, were maybe 10, 15 years ago, we're still following the same basic approach. And so the architecture is familiar, it still has value, but we've seen a, sh a shift, right? Um, let's talk a little bit more about, on the next slide here, what is the benefits of the enterprise business intelligence approach. Right, these are some of the, you know, very uh, big players out there. You've seen a lot of consolidation. So Cognos was gobbled up by IBM. Oracle's been in this space for a number of years as well. Um, SAP brought business objects into their portfolio in order to be a player in this industry. Microsoft has always been there. Um, most of their BI play is based around the SQL Server tools, analysis services, reporting services, and we'll talk a little bit about something else that actually where Microsoft fits very well into both of the different types of approaches. Uh, MicroStrategy is another brand out there that has um, a big footprint in the market in terms of really this more traditional enterprise BI type of approach to analytics. The self-service architecture, there's not really a one architecture slide that works here, so I tried to find something that was really um, generic, right? But basically, this tells us that I don't necessarily have the um, either uh, time or the resources or the scale to go through that entire architecture that we saw with the enterprise approach. Here, self-service basically is a BYOS. You'll start to hear this a little bit more. Bring your own software, right? So this is, hey, you know what? I've got a couple analysts on my team, and they need a tool that lets them grab data from these existing sources, blend it, do their own thing, and, and get information out there quickly. And so we're going to go buy a couple licenses, right? This is a very different model than the traditional enterprise approach, which is, hey, I've got to go procure a server. I got to go buy a really expensive set of licenses and make sure I put a project together and do this whole implementation and maybe there's a data warehouse or data mart project behind that. And again, there's still value to that approach, but it's a monolithic type of uh, scenario. Whereas the bring your own software, self-service analytics is, hey, give me a tool and let's get, it, let's get to work. Um, the right side of this, I kind of, pushed a infrastructure as a service out there. So even with this model, we still see a lot of collaboration as an important requirement, right? We don't make decisions in a vacuum. So sharing the insights that are gained through the self-service tools and publishing them either through the cloud or through some sort of internal um, 
delivery device um, within your own local area network. That's another big piece of this, which extends the self-service architecture out. But really the key here is the ability to bring your own software to the game, plug it into whatever source or sources that you need, do the data blending, and drive uh, the decision making, and deliver dashboards, reports, information out throughout the enterprise um, in, in a very different type of um, architecture, very much more nimble and agile type of approach. So some of the key players here that are kind of fit this mold pretty well is that in Tableau's really um, something that we've seen very much more prevalent in organizations uh, growing just crazily fast. Um, Click is also fits a little bit in both models. Again, you'll again, as John mentioned, you're seeing a lot of uh, crossover in these industries. Uh, but really, the target market for these uh, Logi and Tibco, Spotfire, and then of course now. I mean, you're seeing Microsoft on both slides. That doesn't mean that they're the only ones that can claim to have self-service analytics and enterprise features or benefits. Um, all of the vendors will claim at least some um, carryover across both of those dimensions, but um, Power BI is something that really is targeted at that self-service audience. And so we wanted to kind of uh, place that there to be as, as current as possible in terms of what tools people are seeing and really where we see them fitting in the generic groupings that we've talked about. So why, why did this happen, right? Let's talk a little bit about, I'm not going to go through these slides, John, actually you can click right through the detailed comparisons. We're going to send a link out to a white paper that really goes into depth on this. Um, we didn't want to get to the really granular feature bake-off types of things because things change so quickly. As John mentioned, we went through this exercise and it's taken us months to get to a point where we said, you know what? going out and saying vendor A does these five things well and vendor B does these five things well, the next release that all changes, right? But we still have a really good understanding of which tools are what I like to call purpose built for particular benefits. And so when you start to recognize that, hey, this tool does these things really, really well and this other tool, I can make them do those things, but it takes a lot of extra effort. And there's a reason why that is, right? Because the, there was a decision made in the development of those platforms to make them really good at certain tasks and other things may have been deprioritized. And so as you start to learn more about what your tools do well, then you can make better decisions about what type of requirement or use case maps better to a particular solution. And that's what we're going to get to in just a moment here with some of our use case um, that we've pulled out from our actual real life experiences here. So pros and cons, right? So the enterprise BI traditional approach, highly governed, centralized data, models are rigid, and that can be seen as a downside, but they're well defined and highly governed. And so we know and trust the data. So single version of the truth. Business rules and business logic are centrally managed. Again, going back to that single version of the truth. So when I say this is my gross margin, um, I know that if I pull that from the central data model, any report that uses that metric is going to have the same definition behind it. Right. So lots of strengths, lots of positives. And again, this has been the world that we've lived in for a while as the uh, market shifted to this approach and people saw the benefits. But what happens when? Right, and, and so when we start to see the breakdown of what might have been not um, optimal benefit of, of this enterprise BI approach, so John, on the next slide we can you know, look at, well, okay, this solves a lot of my requirements, but what if I, there's new data that's become available and it's not there, it's not in that centralized data source, so uh, what, what do I do? Um, I need to get out and do some analytics, make decisions that are data driven, but I can't go back to IT and say, go build me out a new application because I can't wait that long, right? So the self-service solution is really there to help complement the enterprise BI model so that we can deliver information to a broader range of users based off of a broader range of sources in a much more timely fashion, right? That's that's really where the benefits are of moving to or adding self-service solutions into the traditional enterprise BI model. 
So that leads us to, okay, great, that's all really good information. I can probably have figured most of that out on my own. Um, what, what kinds of things, you know, can we look at as examples to help us, you know, maybe help you in the audience think about things that you may be running into in a, uh, you know, real-world scenario that helps drive this decision, which tool might be ideal. And so, um, John, I'm going to send it back to you to kick off our first use case. All right. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you, Albert. Okay, so I want to reinforce that um, even though we click through those um, the eye charts, um, there is some pretty interesting information. Um, we put it into a PDF format. It's available on the site, uh, a matrix, and we're going to continue to um, enhance and, and uh, update that over time as as the you know world morphs in this particular space. But I'd encourage you to take a look at that document, uh, download it, um, send it around if, if necessary. So. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to talk about a, uh, a use case in the, uh, predominantly around finance uh, within a large healthcare organization. Um, I also I want to point out that these use cases are not specific clients or projects, but they are based on our uh, collective experience across various projects um, in various uh, subject areas and industries. So <clears throat> don't try and figure out exactly who this is. Uh, because it's it's uh, it's a generic example, but a, a, a fairly salient one based on our um, several projects we've done in this arena. Um, th this large healthcare organization has recently grown through a number of significant acquisitions. While all major parts of the company are using Epic and its associated Clarity product and PeopleSoft for GL and financials uh, as its major operating systems, uh, the organization struggles to produce good consolidated financial uh, non-statutory um, and management reporting. Um, because of the sweeping changes in the industry due to the Affordable Care Act, the company is facing new costs and profitability challenges, as well as its membership churn uh, uh, due to the industry shift away from sort of employer group focus to individual plans. The organization has established several important strategic goals aimed at staying competitive in the new market reality, and has even set specific targets on key metrics to achieve their strategic ends. However, it lacks the ability to drive accountability uh, to this new plan down through the organization because of a highly manual and non-standardized way of producing data across the organization. Uh, typically, a lot of Excel hell. Um, the company would like to produce some standardized reports that show performance on key metrics at all levels of management, from the departmental level to the fully consolidated level. Metrics include not only financial figures from the GL, but also key drivers such as membership, patient days, number of claims, and many other measures uh, related to patient encounters one of the most critical data sources of uh, um, this type of enterprise. Currently, much of the information is being rolled up monthly in, in Excel via a tremendous amount of midnight oil burning on the, uh, by the countless analysts in the finance, finance groups throughout the company. As a result, almost all the financial analysts spend 90% of their time gathering and compiling data and only 10% of their time analyzing it. The reports and dashboards they wish to produce are highly customized to the strategic goals of the org. They're carefully laid out, and they're the same across uh, all departments. Uh, this makes it easy for executives to compare performance across lines of business and allows operational managers to focus on their day jobs of running the company and improving across key metrics like cost containment and quality. The reports must also be securely accessed and in some cases distributed automatically to individuals without continuous access to the company network. The company also desires to leverage existing BI portal um, and software and the knowledge and training that they have already within their organization rather than buy a whole new set of licenses. Furthermore, much of the data needs to be integrated into other documents such as PowerPoint presentations on a quarterly basis. This currently requires a ton of copy and paste manual activity and leading to additional significant delays and typically errors. And in this particular case, <clears throat> an enterprise BI platform uh, was chosen uh, by the client for the following key reasons. First of all, uh, it really is the single source of the truth for all departments and all the levels of the organization. This is, this is uh, the the largest overriding factor. Um, secondly, uh, data sources are centralized, highly structured, and governed. 
um, they're already in that state, and most of these, most of the data being retained is uh, information that is um, broadly applicable in the organization. The business requirements and definitions are well defined and locked by essentially a, th a three to five year plan. Um, what I mean by that is, is in order to achieve their strategic goals, they've identified critical metrics that they don't expect to change, much like in our business, we run against key metrics like, you know, uh, utilization. Um, metrics and, um, uh, and data is broadly applicable across the entire organization. Uh, in our terminology, we like to say this is when data crosses the departmental boundary and it becomes imperative that you, again, hearken back to a uh, single source of the truth so you don't get that classic arguing in meetings as to which data is, whose data is correct. <clears throat> in this particular case, the group uh, wishes to leverage uh, existing in pro, um, enterprise tools for all sorts of reasons, uh, existing resources, knowledge, uh, uh, portals, uh, licenses, training, um, and such. And then uh, security and control distribution, as well as reusable report widgets, were an important piece of this puzzle. So this was you know, this is obviously one of those cases where this is a, a good fit for a traditional BI solution. On the other hand, let's move to another uh, example, and I'm going to flip it back to you, Albert, for this particular example. Great, John. Yeah, thank you. That was a uh, much uh, detailed uh, description of a very common issue that we have with one of our key um, industries that we work a lot with. One of our uh, other industries that we've been seeing a growing uh, number of clients that we brought on board is uh, online e-tailing. And one of these e-tailers was looking for insights into their sales and returns performance. Specifically, they, like most companies in this space, are always struggling to minimize the number of returns. So it is critical that they are able to optimize the product offers or placements that they are putting in front of the visitors to their website. The data environment here is noisy. Merchandising data is coming from various redshift views, but of course this data has to then be blended with inventory, sales, and supplier data. Redshift, or Amazon Redshift, which is a cloud kind of data uh, source for us, is also serving as a way station for other third-party applications that gather web statistics such as tag, hit, visit, and clickstream data. So we are looking at data dumps from places like Google Analytics and Adobe Omniture. The bottom line is that the merchandising analysts are being asked to deliver meaningful analyses from a variety of different perspectives. Each individual business requirement may not be known well in advance, so a predetermined monolithic metadata model is not possible in many cases, and it is often up to the analyst to ultimately blend data across several different sources in order to satisfy a requirement such as combining clickstream with sales and returns data. Another key aspect of this requirement is that at this company ad hoc requests and data discovery projects based on new newly discovered sources like Omniture are exploding. So John kind of went into this in the overview where we're starting to see more of these data discovery types of projects that, that pop up as new data sources get brought into the scope here. And it's not necessarily a traditional approach to I have a specific metric that I'm looking for and I want to have a specific way of or a very well-defined way of, of, of slicing that metric. Uh, this data discovery process is, is a learning process. And so uh, there's currently uh, at this organization another important factor is that there was no existing enterprise BI solution in place. The time to decision is another factor. They need to be able to bring in these new views of data very quickly because ad placement targeted email campaigns based on items abandoned in shopping carts are common requirements for analysis. So there's not a long lead time for a lot of the information. And so, um, as you may have guessed, in this scenario, the client chose a desktop-based self-service analytics or visualization tool. And if we want to come up and kind of reveal the key factors here, um, self-service is all about being able to do these different activities without go outside of the business and go to a centralized IT or shared services group to access data, cleanse the data, blend the data. And obviously, the explore, visualize, and share is kind of a, you know, what we all understand that the analysts are doing 
but being able to kind of complete that cycle is what self-service analytics is all about. So the key factors from our business case here were, first of all, that the, you know data is not all just sitting in an enterprise data warehouse, right? That's kind of the most convenient, but as we start to see things in the modern times, almost the least likely scenario. Hey, for your requirement, is everything just sitting somewhere in a nice, clean star schema? Uh, certainly not in this case. The next uh, really key factor here was the time to decision. And so the ability to get to the uh, you know answers quickly, again, when we don't necessarily have uh, well-defined requirements in place beforehand was another one of the key factors. And um, John, if you're clicking through there, we can move to, because that uh, leads us to also the business requirements are fluid. So again, we don't necessarily have a really well understood um, set of information needs. It's pretty broad and it can change day by day. And so therefore, again, having a monolithic model in place that anticipates all of the needs of the users is not a good fit for this. Also, another important factor here is that there was not an existing enterprise tool, right? So there wasn't something already in place that kind of got you there, right? So we see that a lot as well, where we say, hey, we've invested in this enterprise solution and it does all these things really well, and now we're seeing some slightly different but related requirements, and maybe we'll try and force those into this enterprise platform. That wasn't even a, a factor here because they, they had not had something like that in place at this, at this organization. And then finally, Another thing that I didn't mention very uh, definitively in the overview of the business case, but they wanted to do some really interesting things with modern visualizations. And within those dashboards or scorecards were what they were describing these as, um, they needed to present data that was clearly going to be sourced from multiple different places. So you heard me talk about how they were using Redshift as kind of a way station for, for storing and blending some data at the um, centralized storage location, but the analysts at the end of the day to construct and produce these dashboards and scorecards, we're going to have to pull things from multiple different places and uh, the more nimble self-service tool was a better fit for that. That leaves us to the next business case. And in this scenario, we have one of our heavy industries that we also work with, the capital equipment manufacturer. And we realized here that this client was a long time user of a traditional enterprise BI tool. Okay, And so what we're going to see here is that not every use case is very easy to define, right? We, we understand that we're not trying to make it, hey, if you have these five things in your checklist, then definitely go with this type of tool. Um, that became very clear with, within this organization because they have multiple tools to choose from, but they wanted to kind of do something that leveraged the best of both worlds. And so what we're going to present here is that we have a solution called the Centurus Enterprise BI Connector. This solution takes your existing rich enterprise BI metadata, in this case it's IBM Cognos, which is represented in the first screenshot. John, if you want to go to the next slide, I have a build that kind of takes us through the how the connector works, and I'll talk a little bit about the business case. So this is a screenshot of our BI metadata. We spent many hundreds of man hours building this out and testing it and validating it, and it's great for traditional types of reporting. However, I also want to do something a little bit more nimble, and so the next screenshot is a shot of a Tableau desktop that connects to the enterprise metadata package via the Centurus Enterprise BI connector, and what that allows us to do in the last build here is going to be a little shot of us actually bringing, and it's very hard to look at, but if you've worked with Tableau, you'll notice that this is your data source interface and this over here is actually the set of subjects that is being exposed by our connector that's pointing back at the IBM Cognos layer and using that as the query engine to grab the data but then ability to present and more importantly as I'm going to get back to the business case blend that data into the dashboards and visualizations within the desktop tool. Okay so 
in this business case, the client was struggling with how to handle some sophisticated dashboard requests from their financial analyst. The source data here is complex, consisting of some of your classic systems of records such as SAP, FICO data, as well as a DB2-based enterprise data warehouse. The requirements are a com combination of well-defined traditional financial reporting, as well as a growing demand for ad hoc analyses that span across those traditional sources into new, newly available sources of information such as a rich customer dimension. These data sources do, do not exist in, in the form that they want to use them in any of the existing uh, traditional well-defined uh, sources of data. So unlike in the previous use case, given that a large volume of traditional operational reporting has been coming out of these systems, there's, as I mentioned, an existing enterprise BI metadata layer in place. Significant effort has been invested in developing this very complex and rich metadata, which includes important calculations, parameters, and other business logic. There's a strong push to leverage these business rules, the embedded security, and data lineage, but at the flip side of this, the business is demanding that the dashboards, um, even though they want that accuracy, they want to be able to do different things in terms of how they present the data. Also, another factor here was that the target audience, our, our analysts, are, were familiar and more comfortable with the different desktop-based visualization tool that was also available to them for other purposes, right? So they're kind of coming from that perspective and also, as I mentioned earlier, that the presentation as far as highly interactive maps and other types of geospatial presentations is, is part of the requirement so that they can leverage the uh, performance of their customers across regions and locations, which is part of what's coming from that enhanced customer um, information that's that's a, a coming from this additional source. And so this has typically been something that Enterprise BI tools did not do very well. And so how do I kind of get the best of both worlds, right? So we want to blend in new data, we want to take advantage of some of the more modern visualizations, but we also want, if we absolutely have any opportunity to leverage that existing metadata because that's where the um, really core of, of the uh, information is coming from. And again, the, an enterprise BI connector is a really powerful way to do this. And so the solution, and this is one of the clients that's currently in our enterprise BI connector beta program, was the ideal approach that we both agreed upon because of these factors, right? The first being that the uh, being uh, financial reporting, the data had to tie to the penny, had to be highly governed and trusted. So that was kind of the number one priority. But they said, oh, we'd also like to do these other things. So as we move in, we wanted to be able to blend that data with some other additional data that's become newly available. And that's you know really data that's only specific to certain requirements. So it's not like we're going to go re-architect the data warehouse because this small group of analysts, or even if that was the case, again, time to decision was a little bit more important than saying, well, maybe the next release of the data warehouse in six or 12 months will have that and by that time our requirements moved on, right? We know about that. So flexibility to blend in additional data. And uh, yeah, of course, we know that there's an existing enterprise business intelligence implementation, rich metadata that we've invested a lot in. And then finally, the user base and their skill set um, and the requirements for more advanced visualization and ad hoc analyses was a another key factor. So um, that's where this kind of blending of the two different worlds with the connector, putting the nice desktop visualization purpose-built solution on top of trusted rich metadata gives you uh, be the benefits of, uh, of both of these types of approaches. Excellent, Albert. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, and uh, I wanted to point out that one of the common themes behind all of this is there is a <clears throat> there is traditionally a significant amount of in, of manipulation alignment and transformation in between the raw sources of data and the end users needs for information and that has to happen somewhere and in many organizations it happens uh, in complex report logic in or in um, metadata models, like Albert said, or in some cases in data warehouses and ETL jobs. But you can't get away from that. It's going to happen somewhere. And the, the, the 
these lighter weight, you know, self-service tools allow you to do that data modeling within, uh, say, a, a Tableau, but you still got to do it. So the key is, if you're going to be doing that uh, across lots of different tools, embedding logic in lots of separate tools is a recipe for data, <clears throat> the end user information getting out of sync, which is another key aspect of what Albert's last use case uh, is all about, is making sure that there's uh, you keep as close to a single version of the truth while still maintaining the agility um, and um, uh, lack of redundancy um, you know, in, in the organization. So towards that end, um, uh, use case number four, our final use case, is a mid-sized apparel manufacturer and um, uh, an omni-channel retailer that sells clothing through a wide range of channels worldwide, including company-owned retail stores, catalogs, company websites, indirect and indirect distribution channels such as big box stores and specialty retailers. Their business has grown substantially over the last five years due to good design, strong marketing, and some strategic acquisitions. However, their, their two-year planning window for products leaves little room for error as consumer tastes and channels uh, change rapidly. Furthermore, they'd like to gain a better 360-degree view of all customer activity. We see this uh, uh, throughout uh, the um, clients that we work with. Um, they use a wide range of systems to conduct business, including JD Edwards and Microsoft Dynamics AX for ERP and GL, Tomax RetailNet for store operations, Demandware for e-commerce, and a host of other systems for international operations, supply chain, and forecasting. To run, essentially, they have a lot of core sources of data, a lot of operational systems uh, uh, in, in the organization. To run the business effectively, almost all parts of the company need accurate and timely information on sales, sell-through, inventory at all points of the chain, orders, make plans, and forecasts. For instance, material planners need to know exactly what's selling well in order to order more. Marketing needs, knows, needs to know what excess inventory lies around uh, in order to put on promotion uh, uh, products in order to make way for the next uh, season's items. Merchandising and finance know got to know true cost in order to price styles effectively uh, and on and on and on. They currently lack an easy way to compile and disseminate this information, relying instead on Excel hell and spreadsheet shuffles. Countless hours, daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly, are spent by senior individuals simply obtaining and massaging data. You hear that's a common theme in many organizations. Um, and a great deal of effort goes into rolling up and aligning the data uh, into the appropriate buckets across dates, product lines, and attributes. In other words, VLOOKUP hill. <clears throat> The company would like to produce standardized reports to show key, uh, performance on key metrics at all levels of management from the departmental level to fully consolidated level. And metrics should include not only financial fig figures feeding the general ledger, but also unit volumes, prices, costs, discounts, inventory balances, make plans, forecast, et cetera, et cetera. It's important for this information to go down below the SKU level to sizing, color, and style. It's very important that these metrics be the same throughout the organization and not subject to interpretation or adjustment on a department-by-department -department basis. Um, the types of reporting and analysis, and you would think that this is very similar to the use case number one. However, the, the types of reporting and analyses that this organization needs to run the business runs an entire gamut from standardized KPI dashboards and scorecards and uh, to standardized reports for operational day-to-day -day use to ad hoc queries and free-form analytics, oftentimes done in a one-off fashion uh, as data explorations. The key there is they're trying to determine patterns within their business to properly react to the, um, uh, the changes in their marketplace. Um, much of this data currently needs uh, to be integrated into other documents, such as PowerPoint presentations on a routine basis. A future goal of this organization is to roll this information into predictive analytics uh, systems in order to aid in forecasting and product placement. The client realized that the key to improving their decision-making processes and company operations was not a single tool, but an enterprise data warehouse coupled with several different analytics tools for the following reasons. 
This is a little bit of an interesting, uh, almost trick uh, case here, because the key aspect of this was not the tool itself. Uh, the key factors involved here are lots of complex data sources that need to be blended together. And if you look at the detailed document, if you download, you'll see that some tools are much better at blending together um, uh, significant numbers of different data sources. Um, uh, many of the tools, the lighter weight tools, rely on extensive left outer joins for these those of you on the DBA side of the house, and, and most people understand the implications of that from a performance, usability, and accuracy perspective. Um, in this uh, particular case, the data needs to be significantly transformed and aligned in order to map uh, the various information from international uh, um, store operations and, and supply chain in, uh, to to other forms of data in the organization. Uh, so a lot of work had to be has to be done at the preparation of the data as opposed to at the at the end visualization. There is a significant need to enrich all reports and analyses with additional info. This is very typical in organizations. Hierarchies, roll-ups, additional attributes, uh, such as show me all of the um, products that are selling of a certain color. Um, um, dates uh, are another good example, groupings of seasonality. Um, and then comparison to things like plans and targets is a critical aspect in, in almost all uh, executive and managerial reporting. That information does not typically reside in the same system as the, the source of the transactional data. Data is useful um, for this particular client in almost all parts of the company. It crosses many departmental boundaries. The interesting part is there are folks in the long range, five year out uh, material design side of the house that need to get a read on what's uh, selling and what's not or uh, what, what products are being returned for quality aspects. Um, at the same time, you've got other parts of the, you know, the finance community or the manufacturing and supply chain side looking at this same sort of information. So the information is broadly applicable. And the data must be uh, timely and a single source, of the, single source of the truth. That we hear as a common, uh, common theme. But the, the driver in this particular case is there's a very broad set of analysis that needs to be done. There is no one size fits all. Standardized reports are not going to cut it. Uh, specific dashboards aren't going to cut it. Um, there are certain sets of data, uh, for instance, coming out of the uh, Customer 360 and Omnichannel organization around web logs and, and customer behavior data that is, is uh, changing daily and needs to be linked to some of the core data like Albert mentioned in, in use case number three. Um, so in, th in this particular case, um, we, uh, we see that there's actually multiple tools um, required to get the job done correctly. So with that, the, interesting, the, the key takeaway um, is that really um, it's not about the tool itself. It's about the job. So what you really need to do is determine the job first, and there will be a certain set uh, of jobs actually that are sort of core to these. And, and granted, this is you know there are many different jobs across the organization, so it's not an easy answer, uh, nor is it a point in time answer. But once you've got the job that you're trying to do, then select the right tool. But Again, we always come back to our mantra, about 80% of the work, regardless of where you do it, is done in preparing the data. And we're going to go into uh, some detail on this on some future webinars around new techniques to prepare data. If you've seen some of the stuff in our past uh, webinars, it's not all, you know, has to be put into a classic, you know, uh, data warehouse. You can you can do lighter weight sort of uh, staging of, of data sets with some of the newer tools. But the key here is to get that data prepared so that then you can use uh, um, the the correct tool for for the job at hand. With that, I'm going to just roll quickly through the additional resources section. Uh, I want to call to your attention the next upcoming event is actually a, a, an interesting one, uh, for, particularly for those in the uh, education uh, world. We're going to go into some very specific uh, solutions that are broadly applicable to higher education. Um, and we've teamed up with a client of ours, Portland State, and they'll be talking about a very interesting set of case studies uh, that we've worked with them on. 
I encourage you to attend. As I mentioned in the very beginning, this information is available on our resource library. Uh, it has nice slice and dice capability. Feel free to go in and and uh, and take a look at what's there. And if you find some, if you, if you have find something uh, uh, that you're particularly interested in, can't get your hands on it, uh, feel free to ping me or Albert or uh, info at Centurus. Anybody, uh, we'd we'd love to help you out. So with that, I'm going to move to uh, question and answer, and um, uh, Albert, uh, open up your mic, and I'm going to actually um, uh, go to one question that came in that I, we, a couple of us answered uh, directly uh, to Larry, but I'm going to... Uh, throw it out to you, Albert, to talk to the broader audience because it's a, it's a general one. The issue with multiple tools is no one version of the truth uh, being delivered uh, to and by the end user. How do you ensure that this is balanced with the wants and needs of the end user versus the IT data people and ultimately the C-level people who are using the data information, especially with SOX compliancy? So we touched a little bit about this, but maybe you can go into a little more detail on that. Yeah, John. Um, I wanted to be mindful of time. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody. I know some people have to oh, jump off. Good you know, point. Right, right at 11. Um, if you can stick around for a minute or so, uh, a couple more minutes. We don't have a lot of questions queued up, so I didn't want to address this one. And so this is really, yeah, about balance, right? Um, the way that we look at this is that, again, from a use case perspective, we don't want to replace the value of, you know, uh, existing single version of the truth kind of trusted governed data source because we now have this shiny new object that lets us do other things right and that's really where this comes into play more than anything else it's the biggest question that we do get from our clients who say hey we've been you've been inundated us with this philosophy for decades that you gotta have trusted data and it's got to be highly governed and you can't go out and have this wild west we had that for years and we moved people away from the desktop and now you're saying it's okay to go back there and the reason why the industry has shifted is, first of all, because we were never able to meet 100% of the needs for analysis through this monolithic approach. It was never there. It was never going to get there. And the reason is, is because we cannot anticipate and build into a long-term project life cycle all of the changing needs, first of all, for business requirements, because those are always changing in real time. And then reality nowadays is data sources as well. The new available data sources that have rich information in them are not part of our architecture because it just takes a lot of time to get them built into there. So that's when you have to look back and say, you know what, is it better for us to ignore changing requirements and changing data sources because we've chosen this traditional kind of enterprise build out type of architecture? Or is it are we better served introducing new tools that can get us that information and deliver it the way it needs to be delivered in the compartments where governance and single version of the truth and some of the other benefits of the enterprise architecture are not critical factors right so that's what we wanted to get you to take away from our use cases which was what is the what are my priorities right with this use case if the data has to be highly governed and centralized, then I've got to follow that type of approach. But if it doesn't, if that falls a little bit lower down in my priorities for the requirement, then maybe something that does not fit that mold, that gets me that time of decision, that gives me the flexibility to blend data from different sources, that allows me to own that process as an end user, as an analyst, that's a higher value than just saying, well, I'm going to throw up my arms and say, we can't give you that data because it doesn't fit this um, traditional approach, right? So that, and that's where we're starting to see people say, ah, you know what? It is better that we encourage those users to take that information, discover what's in there, and 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 there basically is an evolution. So, Larry, if you um, think about this, and and anyone else that's in this situation, maybe data discovery and learning about new data sources that come online and, and experimenting and prototyping with very nimble tools then allows you to then graduate that or evolve that to something where you go and ultimately create a new, more traditional architecture around these new requirements and these new sources over time, right? And so that's another 
way to look at how these tools can complement one another is that kind of experimentation, prototyping, kind of skunk works type of projects where we've looked at, uh, discovered value, uh, mapped it to requirements, and now maybe we build out something more traditional around that. But the nimble and agility uh, uh, features of some of these more self-service facing tools are ways for you to get there. And, and when you're doing experimentation, you're doing prototyping, does the data have to be 100% accurate? No, right? But once you get that to graduate and evolve into something that's that's uh, that's that and then being used as trusted information, then yeah, maybe you modify the architecture at some point in the future to make it look a little bit more traditional. But uh, think about, again, where the use cases are and where that uh, governance and um, other features are in terms of the priorities. And uh, it, it's still a, a, sometimes a tough decision, but I think that hopefully you start to see the complements of the two approaches. Excellent. Well, Albert, in the interest of time, uh, per your um, uh, recommendation. I think we've answered um, directly a number of the folks' questions. I would encourage anybody who's still on, if you've got some specific questions, uh, we actually love to hear them. We'd also love to hear if there's certain topics that you'd like us to cover in, in future events. Uh, you can probably tell we enjoy doing this. Uh, it helps us stay uh, uh, sort of on top of the late whatever's happening out in the uh, uh, user base. So with that, I'm going to actually thank you uh, significantly, Albert, for really being the shepherd of this particular session, uh, pulling this stuff together. I'd encourage everybody to uh, download the, the matrix that, that we put together. Uh, let us know if there's some additional stuff you'd like to see out of that. Um, and uh, we hope to see you on uh, future upcoming events. But uh, thank you much for taking uh, taking the time out of your day to um, spend with us.